What's going on fine people of YouTube? In this video, we're gonna take a look at what is new in Xcode 14. Now be aware, this is beta one, so expect a few bugs here and there. Before we jump into things, drop a like down below, hit subscribe, I've got a list pulled up next to me. Let's talk about some of the biggest changes. So first and foremost, the biggest change you'll notice is actually when you download Xcode 14 beta, it's about 30 to 35% smaller. A lot of the simulators presumably have been cut and they actually have been noted to be downloaded on demand and you can add them as needed. A very welcome change so I don't need to delete stuff on my older MacBooks with no space left on it. That being said, we're gonna get started here by creating a new project. And the first thing we'll talk about is right here in this new project menu. So we see we have a new multi-platform tab up here. And what this allows you to do is create one target which you can deploy on multiple platforms. And that saves you a lot of hassle in terms of configuring build settings on a platform by platform basis, especially pushing SwiftUI forward with support for iOS, macOS, and watchOS. This is gonna be far more commonly used, I imagine. So let's create an application here and we'll creatively call this some app. Notice that we don't even have a choice for language or interface since SwiftUI is inferred. And I'll toss it onto my desktop and we'll dive further into Xcode 14. The next thing you'll notice uh, as a change is on the right hand side over here with SwiftUI with particularly uh, interactive canvases or live previews by default. You'll notice there is no run button up here, there's no play button anymore, and everything is just reactive. Now, of course, we are looking at the Mac view since we are multi-platform, so let me switch it on over to a iPhone, and let's actually start making some changes on the left-hand side, and you'll see that things are just going to update in real time. So perhaps we'll give this a background color here, and we'll supply color.red, and you'll see things are much more reactive. Now, sometimes this canvas does pause, and you do need to hit a little resume button, but the biggest change is the fact that it is live and and frankly a lot more stable than what we had before. Now there's actually one other really interesting and important change related to this live preview and that is being able to see variations side by side. So down here at the bottom left of this canvas area we can hit this button and we can say we want to see perhaps the color scheme variant side by side. And now what this lets you do, which is extremely, extremely welcome, is basically develop and see these configurations in one shot instead of having to create you know, multiple previews of different environments manually and having to frankly scroll them up and down. Now, in addition to color scheme, you can also see various orientations as well as my favorite, which is dynamic type, which is one thing that becomes a little difficult to test, especially as you build more and more complex UIs and you wanna make sure that your apps are accessible and functional for anyone using them with variety of font sizes. So that's a look at the canvas here. The other thing that we will take a look at next is the improved autocomplete. So I'm gonna create a new file here and perhaps I'll call it foo. So foo.swift and we're gonna to toss in class foo. And let's say we have inside of here a name, which is a string, a age, which is a integer, and perhaps a, I don't know, let's call it height, which is a double. Now you'll notice as we start typing out init for the initializer, autocomplete is far better now in terms of recommending and actually filling out your constructor. Now this is something that I've personally been jealous of uh, other developers for since particularly, uh, you know, uh, IntelliJ Android Studio has had this for a while, but it's definitely, definitely a welcome change for classes uh, here in uh, Xcode. And I believe this applies to structs as well. Previously, you know, you would have to type this out a little manually, kind of a bummer, but definitely a welcome change. Now, the other thing which is really handy is how autocomplete will showcase your default uh, arguments, rather your arguments with default values. So perhaps we have a age here and it is 18. Now, if I try to construct foo here, you'll see in the autocomplete that age is italicized and that's letting us know that it has a default value. So if I just hit this, you'll see that age is excluded. Now, what I really like about this is if I go and actually just type in ag, you'll see that it will include it, even though age is definitely not the first parameter here. So we've definitely got some welcomed changes to uh, autocomplete, particularly with initializers. And just generally speaking, I've felt that autocomplete has definitely gotten a facelift here. 
The next thing which I haven't gotten a chance to explore too far into, but definitely worth calling out is we now have Swift package plugins. Now this exposes a API where you can run various jobs on your project, things like formatting or linting, and the docs have noted that you can access it via file package. I don't see it in here, presumably. Uh, I'm either looking in the wrong place or we need to write out a plugin and add a package to get it to show up here. Now, in addition to all of these changes, there's some other aesthetic changes which are a huge welcome. So let's jump back to the content view and let's say we have a function in here that is do something. Now, some functions, even though as developers, we wanna make everything you know nimble and concise, end up looking like this with like a thousand lines in them. And one painful thing is sometimes when you're reading code, especially as you start scrolling super far down is you start to wonder, am I in the same function still or have I you know bled over to the next thing? Well, no more of that because now when you scroll, whatever you're looking at will be pinned up here. You can see that both for the uh, encapsulating you know, struct or class or object as well as the function. So as I scroll down here, do something and the content view are pinned, which is definitely a very welcomed change. Now, in addition to you know better functionality and what I like to call aesthetic facelifts are we can also now jump to colors more easily. Now, what does that actually mean? So let's say we have this function test here and I call it from in here. Now, sometimes in large applications, you have a single function, perhaps on a you know common manager object that is called from a variety of places. Now, previously you could leverage this little icon up here to find the callers of a, a particular function or users of a particular object or protocol. Now, it was a little uncommon to know the fact that this existed for folks, as well as it was a little bit hidden away. Now, what Apple has done is we can actually command click just like we used to jump to definition and we now have callers in here. Now, before we actually take a look at that, let me actually call this from our foo file just to add another caller here so we can see this in action. So let's create a function called go. And here we're gonna say content view and we are going to have test. Now I'm also gonna click this and we do have some changes to jump to definition. So if we have definitions in both a uh, you know object like this or conformance via a protocol, the jump to definition also will now show you a better descriptive view of the various definitions so you're not guessing if the definition you're going to is a protocol or the actual instance method. But we're talking about callers, so let's take a look at it. So we'll hit this and I will hit callers here and you'll see very clearly that we have two callers. It tells you, you know, both uh, signatures here and it also tells you, of course, the path to look under as well as a line number. So here we have foo.swift on line 24. So let's see, that brings us to the next thing to talk about, which are some welcomed changes to the asset catalog. And I actually accidentally found another change, which might be documented, might not be, but in asset catalog, we can now bring in a single image. And if it is 1024 by 1024, Xcode will use single scale to scale it up and down. And no more will we need to bring in or use a generator to create all these variants for our application. Now you'll see that we have a warning here. That's because this is just a screenshot and definitely is not the proper width and height. In the assistant editor over here, you can see that we do use the single size property for iOS and we don't need to you know, use a generator. All you need to do is have your designer create one 1024 by 1024 and you are set to go. Now, in addition to that, what we can also do is we can copy and paste images into our uh, Xcode uh, slots here. So if I copy this, let's see if this actually works for my desktop, I can click here and hit paste and it looks like it doesn't, but from Finder, this actually does work. And I believe this was perhaps documented somewhere, but it's definitely new in Xcode 14 since I did see it somewhere on Twitter. Now let's see what else we can talk about. Now build performance is definitely improved. Things are faster, particularly with linking and compiling dependencies for those of you that are into the nitty gritty of build time performance and linking. We also have support for regex, regular expressions directly being checked for correctness and evaluation in the IDE since it is now supported. In addition to that, a more minor change, but definitely welcome is for our device selector, our targets uh, and scheme up here, we will now see recent at the top. We also have you know search more prominently displayed up here, but the recent 
the recently used is definitely uh, a welcome change. So if we deploy off into a particular device or simulators, we won't need to open this and like myself have to filter it down every single time, which is definitely nice. The last thing I'll touch on here are two really, really nice uh, additions to the organizers. We're gonna open that up by going to Window and Organizer, and there are two more tabs in here that you'll see, which are Feedback and Hangs. Now, I've got one of my apps selected, which at the moment doesn't have either of these, which I guess is good. For feedback, we'll see test flight feedback directly in here. We'll see screenshots, the tester information. We'll also have a button directly to email that user back if we want to respond to them. And of course, hangs are a really, really critical thing to have available here so we can make sure that we're never blocking that main queue. Our app is never dropping frames and we have a pretty well-built application. So those are the main highlights that I so far have been you know, pretty excited about in Xcode 14 Beta 1. Now there are a bunch more, of course, and I'll be linking the Xcode 14 Beta release notes down below. There's also a bunch of fixes and improvements. There are some deprecations as well. For example, no more bitcode supported uh, applications will be accepted to the App Store. The watchOS project template is now different. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. But these are definitely the much more common ones that hopefully the majority will be able to see and take benefit of right away. So that is all I've got for you guys. Let me know what other cool Xcode 14 things you found down below. Of course, keep in mind, this is a beta and we'll see improvements over the coming weeks and months. Thanks again for watching. Stay tuned for more dubbed up videos. Tweet the video, share with your friends, follow on the socials, hit that like button if you haven't done so already. Hit subscribe before clicking away. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you in the next one. Thank you.